and welcome to this month's Music by Nun. Now normally, as you know, Music by Nun is quite medieval music orientated because that's my big love and my big passion. And as medieval music really encompasses about 500 years of music, I never get bored being just in that era. But today we're doing something quite controversial. controversial. We're jumping forward in time, almost going avant-garde, and we're now going to be performing some Renaissance music. There's always a big debate about exactly where the medieval period kind of transitions into the Renaissance. And for me, it's, a, it's the moment when beforehand, in the medieval times, you had very much a three-voice settings. You had a cantus line with the melody and then two interweaving lower lines, the tenor and the contratenor. And that really summed up how a medieval piece was constructed. And then at some point in the 15th century, the bass line came along and you now had four voices and the whole sort of shift in the dynamic of composition and music changed. And in fact, it laid down what we know today from choir situations. You have soprano, alto, tenor and bass. And that really comes from this transition. The cantus line became the soprano, the contratenor went a little bit higher and became alto, the tenor went a little bit lower and became what we know as the tenor line, and then you had a bass. And uh, the other thing about Renaissance music that I really like is that they loved having families of instruments. That's when you would have one instrument made in different sizes and they would play together and there would be a very homogenous sound and that can be very pleasing. So luckily in Basel, I know many, many, many talented multi-instrumentalists. And tonight we are going to uh, really kind of show a whole plethora of Renaissance wind music in different families. And towards the end, we'll even get a bit spicy and we'll mix them all up together. Woo! Woo! <laughs> So in a second I'll be inviting Silke and Rafa and Teresa to be joining me and we're going to be starting off blasting out some music on a family of shawms. We're playing a piece that in the, in, it's from a collection called Odhegaton, which means a hundred songs and the piece is titled James, 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 but as it's written by a French composer Jean Mouton and it's printed in Italy, it probably was not pronounced like that. And over the cocktail we can discuss what it probably would have been pronounced like. And apparently it comes from a song, a song about somebody called Jacques, and uh, there's a lot of complaining because apparently he really couldn't quite fulfil all his wife's desires. So that's the, that's the song basis of the first piece we're going to perform. So let's give a big round of applause to Rafa and Teresa and Silka. <laughs> And we're just going to blast a few notes to check we're in tune first. <laughs> If the audience sitting here gets scared, they can, <laughs> <laughs> they can leave now. <laughs> now they know what they're in for. Okay.
happy with how well that went. <laughs> so that was really starting off on a high point. It's the loudest thing you're here tonight. <laughs> Um, and they were shawms. Uh, shawms are obviously wind instruments with a double reed. Uh, they were very beloved back in the day because they could really fill a room or a street with sound, so they were a sign of prestige. You could use it for dancing because people could still dance and eat and talk and you'd still hear the, the music. But there's a very lovely, quiet sister to the shawm called the Dusain. And we're going to go on and we're going to play three pieces on a Dusain concert now. The people watching out there, you're, there's like a little title coming up as we play each piece. Um, but for the people sitting in the room, we're going to start with a piece by Isaac, a Carmen in bar, so a song in F. We go on to a piece by Semphil, I made line su, su dem bren, bren, brunnen, ging, brunnen ging. And then we're going to finish off with a notorious piece, Der Winter is eine strenge Gast. <laughs>
it just get quieter and quieter because now we're going to go to recorders. Another thing they loved doing in the Renaissance was taking famous tunes and using that as a basis for compositions. And for the recorder block, we're going to do two versions of the Fortuna Desperata, an anonymous version in three, and then an anonymous version in four. But also lots of famous people like Josquin and Benoit and lots of different people composed mass settings and also just different polyphonic arrangements of this piece. And it's a very sad song. I was going to ask Rafa to read out the Italian, but I didn't warn her in advance, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> She's Italian, so it's just like, you know, you can, you can read Italian. <laughs> 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 and, if you don't, and if you don't speak Italian, uh, desperate fate, innocuous and maldicted, who blackened the good name of a woman beyond compare. I think I didn't understand the English just as much as I didn't understand the Italian. <laughs> but anyway, it's a beautiful, sad song. <laughs> Doesn't matter what happens before. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So now, it's actually the most important part of the evening, because we're going to make a cocktail. So I suggest maybe if we just shift the music slightly to the side. <laughs> So um, every time we do Music Bar None, it's a mix of friends coming together to play music in this beautiful bar setting, but it's also very important that uh, there's a special cocktail that fits the event. And uh, I love Googling and researching, and I, th and I thought, oh, maybe there's some nice Renaissance cocktail. We could have like a historical cocktail that would go really well with um, this program. When I Googled Renaissance cocktail, there is literally a modern day cocktail that's called Renaissance. Yeah. So I, I had to, I really had to try it out. And we've already practiced, we practiced this. <laughs> that's the thing we practiced the most yesterday. Um, <laughs> And it's quite an unusual cocktail because um, it comes all the way from 1876. There's a, there's a hotel, hang on, where did I write this down? There's a hotel in New York, the Astoria, I think. Let me just, can't find that, but anyway. Uh, I think it's the, the Astoria Hotel in New York. In 1876, there was a, a barman who invented this cocktail and that's actually quite unusual because most of the cocktails we drink today were either coming from the 1920s when you had the prohibition era in America or in the late 90s beginning of the 2000s there was a whole new wave of cocktail drinking and a whole new genre of cocktails like, um, like porn star martini or the espresso martini they come from this new wave of like even renaissance of cocktails but this is a renaissance cocktail from the end of the 19th century which i find quite amazing it's and you can see because it has some quite unusual ingredients the main ingredients is cognac which you don't see so often in cocktails today and that is you have a lot of cognac and you mix it with a bit of sweet red vermouth and a bit of limoncello and then you have to try and get hold of peach bitters. So that was also a bit of an internet search to find some peach bitters in time, but they arrived. And they're really great and they really add something to the taste. So I'm glad I went to the effort of finding it. You put all that together in a cocktail shaker. You add some ice. Tip, what I've been told is you have to shake cocktails until it's so cold you can't hold the, shop, the cocktail shaker anymore. So that's what I'm going to do now. You can talk amongst yourselves or sing a song. You can sing Fortuna Desperata. glasses. They're from Ikea, so they're super cheap, but I find them very elegant and beautiful. Sponsor me. Yeah. Sponsored. <laughs> Sponsored by Ikea. <laughs> but we've broken, we, we had like loads of these, but we're down to three, so uh, I think I'll, I'll have this little one. And I have enough, so afterwards I will make a round for all of us. Oh. Yeah. And I hope if you're watching uh, out there, you've looked at the cocktail in advance and you're sitting there sipping it as you watch this concert. So. It's also been a bit of a tradition now that my friends and colleagues will come and join me and we're going to drink the cocktail and just have a little chat about... Life, Renaissance music, 
reeds, recorders, all sorts of stuff. <laughs> so. I use it differently. <laughs> so, first of all, cheers. Thank you so much. Cheers. cheers. Thanks for having us. Cheers. 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 And cheers to cheers. all cheers. out there. Cheers. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's better. Mm. Last night, mm. actually, this is one thing I find very interesting about cocktails. We made this yesterday, but I used a really kind of cool, refined, Basel, artisan vermouth. Uh, and now I'm just using much more of a mainstream one. And sometimes for cocktails, you just need totally the normal, the normal sweet um, ingredients. And if you get too fancy and too artisanal, it's sort of just it's not what it was designed for. So. Did you have so, to change the limoncello? That's it. No. no. So it's no. only the difference. The only thing that's the difference. I did put more limoncello in it, though. Yeah. Mm. yeah, that always helps. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I think we should have a little chat because we all play all these different instruments like reeds and recorders and different types of uh, shawms and dusains and oboes and dulcians and bassoons and cocktails and zinc. Cornet. Cornet. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, you haven't quite seen exactly how many instruments you can play yet. You've only been a small like iceberg tip of what we, what we can do. So, I mean, obviously I know how that affects my life, like why I've ended up doing it, but I'm curious to know how you guys stumbled into this, this world of multi-instrumental playing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's quite simple. You start with recorder and then suddenly fall in love with playing concert music because it's just so amazing to play at a young age in a, in, in a group. And yeah, for me, it was really playing concert that I blossomed. Like I, I started to understand musicality. And yeah, that's what we got. Got me hooked. Into music. Yeah. And then how did you then like make the jump to start playing bassoon and zinc? And oh yeah, and I, I met really interesting teachers that were also multi-instrumentalists. And um, yeah, I got to try them. And I, I also try to tell my students, you, if you get a chance, always try different instruments. You get a different experience. Yeah, you have a different way of making music with each Yeah, instrument. but it's, uh, yeah, then you get hooked on the next <laughs> Sometimes dangerous. Exactly. There's always another instrument that one has to buy. And exactly. A different size, you a never different pitch, a different... have the right recorder as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Some buy shoes, some buy instruments, no? <laughs> yes, for sure. My, my, my pension retirement plan will just be sell all my instruments and then just yes. travel the world for, for five years or something. Yeah. What about you, Soka? Oh, well, <laughs> well, I also started with a recorder. No, perhaps this is a German thing. <laughs> and I was a hardcore recorder player, a recorder only. So I think when I started the first time with a tenor dulcian, I was perhaps twenty-five or something. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I was completely, as we say in German, talentfrei. I, I think I could make one note that I had a feeling my, my eyes already popped out and, and my lips were bleeding and I didn't have enough power to play it. And I was like, no, I think, I think I stay with the recorder. And then somehow I had to do a little final exam on the Dulcian, so I decided to practice. And I can tell you now that <laughs> practicing helps. <laughs> So I really got into this, okay, let's play it every day, and then it, it really got a bit better over the years. <laughs> and then, yeah, I think the first, for me it was hard, of course, starting with a double read with 25, where normally you have, you're starting your professional career as mm -hmm. a double read player. And I still feel like, oh, I still don't know what to do. <laughs> but I think the first different instrument is the worst. And then comes the third one. So I then started with the shawms, and then once you have the shawms, you're interested in Dusen because there are some rumors about the Dusen. You want to find out what is a Dusen. <laughs> and then once you have the Dusen, you can also start the crumb horns. And then yes. actually, there are very different recorders also in medieval times. Yes. Let's yes. investigate about different re uh, recorders. Let's, uh, there are different recorder types in Renaissance as well. 
So it's an endless story. Yeah, I think it's life almost is like too kind short. of going into one beautiful house and like each, each like you, you sort of discover one room and then you're like, oh, but there's a door there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's go through yeah. that door and see <laughs> see what that can offer. And uh, and how did you? Because I I started playing oboe when I was quite young, like about eight. So I think I went mm -hmm. I went through that kind of embouchure. Because you sound awful, like double reeds sound awful when you first start. Because you really have to learn how to control this 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 vibrating read and of course at first you really you know your parents are going like why did you choose this instrument <laughs> but then with time you learn the nuance and the the subtlety so uh yeah i, I don't know where i'm going with this question but uh, yeah I, can, I mean like but when you're a child you're allowed to sound yeah. i can imagine and you it's don't, hard, you don't hard so much i think if you start with 25 i had kind of a musicalische Vorstellung, you know, like an imagination, how it should sound, and it didn't sound like this. And I felt, well, how can I make this sound? Because the people that I saw and I played with, concert music, and I was like, okay, you can, so it's possible on this instrument, but we put the lips like this, or like this, or like this, or like this, and nobody can really answer yes. it. I yeah, she does. Up, yeah, that's right? another thing. Because also, like, for instance, as a child, you learn oboe, and there's many different schools of learning how to play. Because mm. it's a, you know, it's a modern instrument, so there's many thoughts, and you you follow what your teacher says. But with these Renaissance instruments, of course, there wasn't like a playing guide written at the time of like you put exactly this much reed in your mouth and you blow like this, and so it's ev everyone has been discovering these instruments by learning, by doing, and everyone kind of finds their own little. And also by Colour sharing, and no? I mean, if I play your instrument, it's like, ah, okay, this is how her reads work. On the oh, same yeah. instrument, it's like, mm -hmm. okay, I could do a bit more like this, it needs more air, it needs less air, it needs more air from the left lung, <laughs> less from the right, and if the wind is coming from this, it's from southwest, it's <laughs> the whole southwest. universe. <laughs> and I think even although we play together and we have the same drive for the music, we use different reads and mm -hmm. we play them differently. Mm -hmm. Because our, our physiognomy or the, the, the teeth are different, different yeah. Yeah. or how much you do really with the, with the diaphragm or I don't know. I think there's so many factors. If you change one factor, it has a big effect on, on the rest. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the part where you can go crazy yes. or the part where you have a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It always makes it better. Rafa, do you have any uh, extra thoughts? No. No. <laughs> How did we end up here? <laughs> <laughs> she just came for the cocktail. Because <laughs> that's actually it's an interesting thing you say. Because um, you know, obviously, it's it's hard being a multi instrumentalist. You have so many instruments and so many reeds, and you have to make sure that you've all got the right thing at the right time, and you've made reeds, and and every instrument has a different kind of pressure, a different embouchure, so you're jumping around. Um, so it's you know it's quite a challenge to do a program like this, um, but we know that it happened at the day back back then. People were multi instrumentalists. I think that's today you have the idea more of being like virtuosic violinist or star soprano or something. Perfect. But uh, per perfect in <laughs> perfect in in kind of one genre. But back in the day, they they were you know like everyone played many many even strings and winds and all sorts of stuff. Um, but the thing that struck me is that they're only having to deal with, they stayed in one court, they were playing with one group of people for long mm. stretches of time, they were playing one mm. repertoire, whereas we're doing this for the Renaissance, but we also play medieval music, we also play Baroque music, contemporary music on our instruments, uh, mm. so I, I think it's... Uh, in, on one level you can be really amazed that they were multi-instrumentalists, but on the other hand it was easier for them because they had not as many factors as no. we have today. We listen to German techno music as well. Like that's <laughs> like, uh, I had, I had pop music and I had all these influences and then trying yeah. to play only Renaissance music historically informed. It's hard. It's hard, <laughs> yes. Yes. So I think we should uh, carry on and show you some more of the different instruments that we play. We're going to do our final block where we're kind of really mixing it up. We're going to have zinc and pommers and a dulcian. And we're going to play a pavan and a galliard based on one of these, these war films, uh, films, <laughs> themes. It was uh, another fashion, not just, not just taking famous songs was a fashion, but, but also there was a big, big, big fashion of... Um, I think there was a famous poem written at some point about a, a war or something, and then it spawned a whole pile of compositions uh, imitating... 
the sounds of drums and battle approaching and we're going to do one version of it. Uh, I just have to think what instrument I have to play in this floor. <laughs> Come back, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Actually, the worst thing is just having the reeds wet at the right time. Oh, yeah, mine <laughs> That's the annoying thing. Yes, of course. Yeah, so this is a final block in our concert tonight. It's a short and sweet evening, so we have more time for the cocktails.
couple of thank yous. I want to thank you guys for, for coming. Trot's Dame hangovers from last night's rehearsal. <laughs> and playing so well. I want to thank Mark. And yeah. I want to thank you guys also for, for coming out on this balmy, beautiful evening and spending the time with us. And of course, I want to thank all of you out there for tuning in and watching. We have one last, last, last piece where we are really doing a crazy combination of instruments <laughs> that probably never did play together, but we think it sounds cool. We decided it yesterday after we had the first concert, yes. <laughs> to our defense. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.